Okay, great. I'll start from uh, thanking uh, uh, organizers for uh, giving me a chance to share with you how we basically develop a correlated light electron microscopy and how we use it uh, uh, in our uh, past and uh, recent uh, uh, studies. So um, I will uh, talk today about a technology which is called uh, correlative uh, light electron microscopy. And uh, uh, basically, this technology uh, allows user to look at the structure of interest in light cell and then freeze the cell by fixation and find the same structure under electron microscope and to understand its 3D architecture. Okay? Uh, if we uh, talk about the history of correlative uh, light electron microscopy, this term can be found even in very early studies, kind of uh, starting from uh, 60s. But that time, uh, the correlation was uh, uh, intended as a correlation between what you see in the similar specimen in light microscopy separately and the electron microscopy separately, OK? Then people were correlating the features between two technologies. While starting from the uh, 2000 onward, uh, it uh, basically became the um, new uh, method which can be considered as kind of uh, fluorescent protein-based super-resolution video microscopy, which uh, allows you first to track the uh, structure or event in your uh, or cell of your interest in vivo, and then to take a snapshot of exactly the same cell or exactly the same structure with the electron microscope. The development of uh, correlative uh, uh, light electron microscopy lamp in its modern uh, uh, um, uh, way was basically uh, forced by GFP revolution in cell biology. I always thinking about that this was one of the uh, greatest invention and people who applied the GFP got Nobel Prize at the end. I'm working in membrane trafficking field and you heard from Federica some hints uh, about uh, how uh, it works in the certain cell types. Uh, in our field, that was a really, really uh, great breakthrough. I was uh, um, very lucky to be in the lab of uh, Jennifer Lippincon Schwartz, who first uh, started to apply GFP technology in membrane trafficking field. And here you can see a movie uh, from uh, the paper of uh, John Presley from her lab, published in Nature, showing how the proteins move from endoplasmic reticulum with a large network to the uh, Golgi complex here in uh, a perinuclear area. So if you look at the uh, uh, moving uh, uh, vesicles which emerge from endoplasmic reticulum and uh, go to the uh, perinuclear uh, Golgi compartment, you can derive a lot of information. The speed, directionality, concentration of the protein, etc. So all this was impossible to track by uh, microscopy of fixed cells. And indeed, in the uh, news and views uh, regarding this paper, other big dog in the member trafficking field, uh, Hugh Pelham, um, wrote that a few moments of time-lapse video are enough to resolve an issue that years of microscopy of fixed cells have failed to settle. This was really a great uh, uh, um, discovery. Uh, however, if you look at these uh, uh, structures, the resolution of light microscopy is not sufficient to tell 
what is the real architecture. And uh, unfortunately, like microscopy, it cannot achieve a sufficiently high resolution. So spectacular though it is, G3 technology has its limits, okay? So that was fun, because uh, at, at a certain point, uh, Jennifer Lippinko Schwartz started to send uh, uh, papers, nature cell, nature cell, science, etc. everything accepted. Then it's got to a certain limit. Then one of reviewers uh, said, Jennifer, you cannot make science watching TV, okay? <laughs> Please show me electron microscopy. In the meantime, um, here in Italy, in uh, Mario Negri Sud Institute, uh, we started to thought how to combine two things, GFP technology and electron microscopy. Because if you look at the uh, structures which carry the protein from the Golgi complex to the plasma membrane, like in the case of this movie, it's really tough to understand uh, what are they in reality? What is their fine structure? They could be just simple vesicle or something complex, cluster of vesicles, etc. So <coughs> to do that, we uh, 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 basically asked the question whether the force of <laughs> electron microscopy could be with GFP. And this required us to settle a kind of tour de force method that allow you to follow the same structure in living cell and then uh, under the electron microscope. So if you look at the principle of correlative light electron <coughs> microscopy, it's quite simple because uh, you have to characterize a dynamic process in life cell. Then on the basis of this characterization, you choose a particular structure or stage of interest that you have to uh, uh, analyze by electron microscopy. Then you fix the cell, take two pictures of the same structure uh, at the light and the electron microscopy levels and integrate information. What are the advantages? If you look in the electron microscope at a certain structure, you know the preceding history, okay? And uh, I will show you one, uh, one example where it really matters later. Then you are dealing with really high resolution. And let me be honest, as electron microscopist, I would like to say that non-light microscopy super resolution technology comes close to what you can get with electron microscope, okay? Finally, the structure of interest which you are looking at the light microscope with electron microscope could be visualized in the context of the cell. Because when you look in the light microscope, you see only fluorescent spots. You can put five, six fluorochromes, but they don't show the entire complexity of the cell. They don't show all organelles or structures which you can visualize with electron microscope. And in some, certain cases, this is really important. Okay. The main object which we have studied with uh, uh, CLAM, or we started to study with CLAM, was uh, uh, biosynthetic pathway. Uh, just to make a short uh, introduction, um, First of all, I would like to say that this is very, very important system in the function of uh, an entire cell. About one third of uh, um, genes which encode proteins are associated with secretory pathway activity. So usually how it works is that uh, proteins which have been secreted or delivered somewhere in the cell through this pathway are synthesized at the ribosomes attached to the endoplasmic reticulum and get incorporated into ER lumen or its membranes. Then they are delivered to the Golgi complex for post-translational modification like glycosylations or, or proteolytic cleavage. And finally, in the simplest case, they are delivered from 
exit pole of a Golgi, trans-Golgi network called also EGEN, to final destinations, which could be endolysosomal system, plasma membrane or cell external, or storage organelles, which uh, uh, are used by cells to uh, secrete things in response of usually extracellular stimuli. Now, if uh, uh, we took uh, textbooks of uh, uh, mid-90s, uh, we can find that, that the trafficking between different compartments of secretory pathway were uh, shown to be executed by these small, very regular organelles called vesicles, membrane vesicles, or coated vesicles. People uh, define them differently. So uh, this was the textbook, but then we started to look uh, inside the live cells. We actually found uh, a bigger complexity. Here, again, you see transfer from a Golgi complex here to the plasma membrane around. And the things which carry proteins from a Golgi to plasma membrane look like frequently snakes or more complex structures. So uh, at this point, we uh, wanted to characterize this process and wonder how these structures form from a Golgi complex, how they look when they transit uh, through the uh, cytosol, and how their fusion with target membrane happens. So the simplest uh, 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 way to study this was to use very well-known uh, uh, construct okay, in membrane trafficking called VSVG, GFP, so GFP is fluorescent protein. VSVG stands for vesicular stomatitis virus G protein. This is a uh, um, type one transmembrane protein with N-terminal in the lumen of organelle or cell exterior and C-terminal in cytosol. The tag was uh, linked to C-terminal without affecting the properties of the protein trafficking. Uh, the advantage of this protein is that you can use different temperatures to synchronize it in different uh, uh, secretory compartments. At the 40 degrees, the protein accumulates in the endoplasmic reticle and it doesn't exit from there, allowing you to, uh, let's say, block traffic in at the level of ER. With 20 degrees, the protein can be stopped in the uh, Golgi, especially in trans-Golgi network, and finally, 30, shift to 32 degrees uh, or permissive temperature allows you to uh, um, activate its trafficking from either endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi. Now, uh, how to uh, look uh, the structures of interest with the uh, 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 electron microscopy technology after you visualize them in uh, living cells. This is a, mm, mm, let's say, short overview of the method. The important point that you have to grow uh, your cells at the cell locate cover slips, which have coordinated grid, okay? I will explain you then why it is important, but mostly it's because uh, you have to have a, a possibility to track the cell of interest from light to electron microscopy without, uh, you know, a lot of problems. Now, you transfect the cells or infect with uh, transduce with virus carrying the protein. Then uh, uh, one can observe uh, uh, events in life cell trafficking from Golgi to plasma membrane and track the structure of interest. After that, cell is fixed at the moment of interest, and then we have to convert uh, GFP fluorescent into something which one can see with electron microscope, okay? And uh, we did it with just simple uh, immunolabeling of GFP, okay, of, of a fluorescent uh, construct of interest. Um, and Immunolabeling can be uh, done for electron microscopy with either gold or peroxidase. Both products give uh, electron dense signal trackable through the EM sections. 
Then uh, the cell after immunoglobulin get embedded in the resin. Uh, we trim the small uh, blocks, which could be actually as thin as uh, one cell. Cut serial sections, which can be picked up on the slots and analyze it under the electron microscope. Looks easy on the picture, but not so easy when you start doing that. Then serial sections get analyzed, okay? And uh, on the basis of that, you can uh, reconstruct the structure of your interest in 3D. Now, this is one of the first movies we made uh, with the uh, uh, DSV GGFP looking at the transport from the Golgi complex to plasma membrane. The goal was to look at the uh, structures which carry protein from one compartment to another and to find them at the level of uh, electron uh, microscope. Okay. Here the movie starts and you can see these transport carriers departing from the Golgi. And at this point, the cell was fixed. Okay. Now, what we did, we immunolabeled with cells with antibodies against VSVG and when we secondary FAB fragment conjugated with HRP. Okay. So we converted whatever we saw as a bright fluorescent into dark electron dense uh, uh, signal for electron microscopy. Then we cells was refound on the cover slip, which has coordinated grid. And we cut sections, serial sections of this cell uh, you can see that it's have bilobed nuclei and Golgi complex in the center. Here you have bilobed nuclei and the Golgi in the center. As you can see here, we didn't have digital camera at that time, okay? So we stitched photos, okay? Mm -hmm. And this was uh, late 90s. Uh, what we did then, uh, we actually reconstructed the structure which we found and corresponded to these transport carriers. This is Golgi, this is carrier here in the end. This is Golgi, this is carrier. And uh, in uh, serial sections, it looked like not simple vesicle, but quite big and complex structure with uh, uh, vacuolar part and uh, some uh, uh, tubular branches. We reconstructed this in 3D. And then we found that uh, tubular circular structures actually were carrying the protein from the Golgi to the plasma membrane. So we did several of uh, these reconstructions. Now, uh, the next question was how such complex structure formed from a trans-Golgi network? Because the common view was that you produce simple vesicles, the code select cargo from the Trans Golgi network, uh, make uh, these small vesicles, and they go to the plasma membrane. People still uh, hypothesize that, that the vesicles, then they form it from a trans Golgi network, can fuse to each other, forming something more complex, like with the carriers which we saw, that then at the end deliver to the plasma membrane. Instead, uh, the other idea was that you can just pull and cut big chunks of reticular membranes, which are tubular circular in any case, and then dock them on microtubule and uh, send uh, to the plasma membrane, okay? So uh, how to distinguish between these two models? First of all, uh, it was important <coughs> to characterize the process of post-Golgi carrier formation in a light microscopy or at the light microscopy level. Here you can see uh, how this process happened. So what we noted, and you will see this in the movie, that frequently uh, VSVG exits from the trans-Golgi network or from the Golgi within elongating tubular elements which are pulled from the Golgi in long microtubules and then break down. Here is the movie. So you can see some of these events here too. 
So our goal was to understand whether these things emerging from the Golgi complex in the center of the cell are unique structures or composite of the train of vesicles, because we, this was alternative idea. To do that, we looked at this cell, where you will see event of post-Golgi carrier formation or formation of post-Golgi carrier precursor in this area. And uh, once it started to uh, bud from the Golgi, we fixed the cell. Okay? What we did then, we uh, looked at the same area under the electron microscope. You can see here the nucleus Golgi, nucleus of the cell of the same shape in electron microscope image. Golgi complex is here. So magnifications definitely are not the same, but uh, quite close. Then we zoom in this area where we observe the formation of this carrier precursor. We've in serial section found some Golgi membranes. In this case, we used gold membrane, which contained VSVG GFP highlighted by these spots. Then in the sections, we found that Golgi membranes uh, kind of uh, start to uh, um, send out a tubular element which is very evident in this section and ends in the force. Uh, basically, uh, this structure is quite complex and uh, consists of a tubular elements which have some branches and even fenestration resembling uh, donor TGN transgolgi membrane. This is the reconstruction of the uh, entire things, and you can see branches, buds, even small fenestration here. The interesting point, and this is why it's important to look uh, everything in the context uh, of the uh, electron microscopy. Here we have mitochondria, and when reconstructed, we found that. Basically, this tubular protrusion comes through the hole in the mitochondrial network. Uh, you will never uh, see this uh, using uh, light microscopy or time lapse of a single laser because you can see only one uh, uh, signal. And we had an idea that this mitochondria could provide the energy for the process of a carrier formation and pulling along microtubules. Next, what we uh, found uh, and discovered was related to the fusion of these post-Golgi carriers carrying VSVG GFP with the plasma membrane. Because one of reviewers of our paper said, okay, guys, you see all these fancy things moving through the uh, site, of the, but are they real transport carriers? Do they really move the protein from the Golgi to the plasma membrane? And that was a, a, a difficult question to, to answer, but uh, we managed to show that indeed the structures which form from the Golgi, then transit the cytosol, really fuse with the plasma membrane. Here uh, you will see a movie. So this is JFP fluorescence just inverted for the sake of uh, clarity. And uh, here, in this area, you will see the transport carrier which moves from the Golgi towards plasma membrane, it will be indicated by arrow, and start fusing with it. Here it is, okay? And we try to catch it in the moment uh, of fusion with the plasma membrane. Oops. You can see the drop of fluorescence because when you add the fixative, uh, GFP fluorescence goes down because uh, we have glutaral degate and it's crosslink a lot of, uh, 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 let's say, um, lysines. So the structure of the protein changes. Now, uh, once the cell was fixed, we uh, tried to find the place of carrier fusion, which is here. This is Golgi complex. Here we are looking at VSVG fluorescence. At this point, we reason it. So, if this structure is fusing with plasma membrane, okay, 
if it's in contact with plasma membrane, it should be accessible to antibodies which recognize ectodomain of vesicular stomatitis virus G protein. So we didn't thermobilize this cell, okay, with saponin or triton or whatever which is used to let antibody get inside, but we just added antibodies from exterior without any thermobilizing agent. And our question was whether we will find the signal or not. So when we labeled uh, the cell with anti-VSVG antibodies without thermobilization, we saw that the structure of our interest was kind of labeled, okay, but we wanted to be sure and proceeded for electron microscopy. We used these uh, uh, microvilli at the edge of the cell as a kind of uh, uh, landmarks to find the, the structure of interest, and then we looked at it. It was really labeled with VSV G, indicating that the structures which we were looking at were bona fide transport carriers capable of transporting the protein from the Golgi to the plasma member. At this point, our paper was accepted to JCB. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, at the end, uh, um, what I would like to say is that uh, um, we found that uh, uh, trafficking between Golgi and plasma membrane frequently happens uh, in, in the manner that you form carriers by uh, scission of uh, membranes from the TGM, they could be complex in uh, shape and large in size, then move to the uh, plasma membrane where they entirely fuse with the target. Uh, membrane. Uh, it, uh, uh, this paper had several impacts. First, uh, uh, if you look at the textbook picture in 2003 and 2008, here you have a change because uh, uh, the bigger structures carrying more protein were placed uh, in the new textbook on the basis of our study. And that makes sense, okay, because if you have to move a bulk of uh, passengers, for example, from Europe to United States, you don't use small private jets, but you pack everybody into jumbo jet and uh, send overseas, right? Okay, this is this cost less rather than using private jet for single passengers. So this is one thing. Uh, Next, uh, this paper, which we published in 2000, was a kind of milestone of uh, opening a new era in uh, correlative light electron microscopy in CLAM, because even uh, specialists in the field recognized that uh, uh, this paper, the new era of CLAM, more or less started with uh, uh, the paper by Polishuk et al., in which we combine a GFP light microscopy imaging with immunolabeling for GFP for EM. So uh, this was very well received by community in membrane traffic in the field and in microscopy as well. And if you make now the search for CLAM correlative light electron microscopy with Google, this uh, paper pops up among the first and it's uh, mostly cited uh, on correlated. So, this is not to make an advertise, but is to make advertise for technology, let's say. Um, now, um, ah, why this is important? Because uh, if you look at the uh, uh, use of the method, okay, it was a kind of uh, increase after uh, the, the, that stage, because in 2000, uh, uh, there were 11 papers using it, and while in uh, 2014, we started uh, to have uh, uh, close to uh, 80 or so, okay? So many people like it and use it, despite it's uh, quite technically demanding. Now, uh, in uh, uh, the next uh, um, um, few minutes, let's say, <laughs> I'll try to show you a couple of things. How this technology was used to, to uh, identify uh, transport intermediates operating in a different transport route, and then another application of uh, this method. 
So if we look at the uh, um, traffic in the route, which uh, uh, goes from the transgolgi network to endolysosomal system, it's of great importance because regulate the uh, function of lysosomes. And uh, it's driven by adapter proteins, clatrin, AP1, and gigas, which interact with mono-6-phosphate receptor, with which fishes lysosomal hydrolysis from the bulk of a protein moving through a Golgi. Uh, kind of light microscopy and electron microscopy offered um, conflicting views of how the transport carriers in this pathway are organized. And uh, light microscopy f uh, frequently uh, shows the uh, large and pleomorphic carriers moving from the Golgi carrying, uh, carrying mono 6 phosphate uh, receptor. While electron microscopy usually shows vesicular profiles, although some short tubules can be seen. So how to reconcile these two? Once uh, Juan Bonifacino, who working in this uh, uh, area, came to me and said, Ron, why don't we make correlative? Because people uh, ask, and ask me this question, but uh, I said it's tough to make electron microscopy. And I said, no, 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 look, there is a correlative light electron microscopy which you can use. So we, with Quan, decided that uh, we have to look at these uh, carriers, which uh, can be decorated by giga GFP or AP1 GFP or mono 6 phosphate uh, receptor GFP. Here you will see three of them moving outside uh, uh, the Golgi area. Here. They are indicated by errors in, in any case. First, second, and third. So we move rapidly to periphery, and then we'll fix them. Okay? Then we wanted to be sure that one, they are not endocytic, but they are really exocytic, because in perinuclear you might have recycling endosomes or other things which could uh, uh, kind of messy interpretation. So what we did, we added the tritsy dextra to the cells and uh, observed that these structures of our interest didn't contain endocytic markers, which fulfills the whole endocytic system. So we were sure that we are dealing with structures of biosynthetic pathway. Now, we started to look at the area where all these three carriers were located in electron microscopy. You can uh, see here a correlation between two images. Golgi here, nucleus is here. Now, zoom in here, we found uh, three structures, which one look like as a vesicle. Here you can see uh, labeling for GFP, for uh, giga GFP. And this one, so it's classical clattering quartet vesicle. Another was kind of fork with tubular part and two clattering quartet buds. And the third was kind of uh, uh, saccular vacuola. Uh, one can uh, uh, appreciate clattering coat on the surface of all three. And then we reconstructed this one. We observed that it really looked like fork with uh, uh, two clattering coated butts uh, on, on the tubular part. Then we analyzed the percentage of uh, different shapes and found that these kind of what we call grape-like structures, tubules with number of butts, uh, represents the majority, both in the case of mono 6 phosphates and giga uh, carriers. So uh, this, again, make a sense in terms of uh, you know, organization of uh, uh, transport carriers which uh, can adopt less or more proteins. So then, uh, usually the cell is happy and it needs uh, not so many uh, lysosomal uh, proteins to deal with, uh, uh, you know, uh, material which ends up in the lysosomes. It synthesize and transport not so much lysosomal proteins. So even they can be packed in the simple carriers like vesicles or something slightly bigger. However, there are situations like uh, lysosomal stress or something like that. Then uh, cells start to synthesize more cargo, okay, which is directed to lysosome, and you have to pack it. But so while packing cargo, these domains which select uh, by cluttering and adapter proteins from the bulk. Uh, try to adapt more and more and more, and finally uh, we end up with uh, big complex structures rather than simple vesicles. <coughs> okay. 
So the amount and size of cargo probably matters for the shape of the uh, transport intermediates. Now, if we look at the perspective of the uh, uh, correlated light electron microscopy used, I think uh, there are several areas of development there, uh, according also to consensus of electron microscopies all over the world. So uh, where the uh, further development could happen is that uh, in super resolution microscopy. So I hope that once we will have uh, uh, better uh, light cell imaging also with super resolution light like, uh, like this uh, light sheet microscopy developed now by uh, Eric Betzik. So better <coughs> resolution on the light microscopy side wouldn't, wouldn't uh, harm them. Uh, moreover, moreover, electron microscopy and CLAM can be used actually to define how good is your super resolution, okay? Because I think that the ultimate uh, <coughs> or whatever you see is electron uh, microscopy. Next, um, CLAM could include now uh, a new EM technologies like dual beam or block phase, which allows user to uh, analyze really large volumes entire cells or even group of cells uh, in 3D, okay? I will come to this later and will show you an example of such analysis. Uh, finally, uh, another two uh, uh, developments related to fixation. So we can think avoiding chemical fixation for doing correlated light electron microscopy to avoid artifacts. But the problem still exists that how fast you can freeze the cell. Now there are stages of light which allows you to transfer in few seconds. The best and the record is four seconds between last frame and freezing. And freezing. But this is still a lot for rapidly moving structure. Because for example, the structures which I'm looking in, in uh, four seconds would move for 20 microns, let's say. So you don't see exactly the same picture, okay? For single cell, it could be okay, I think. If you are not interested in the, the, what is going on, but just interested to look at the same cell before and after fixation. Then, finally, uh, people are working on the development of uh, the probes that allows a rapidly conversion of the uh, um, fluorescent signal into uh, something electron dense for electron microscopy. And now there are uh, APEX uh, and a uh, number of other um, probes which could be used uh, for this purpose. Okay. So, uh, how uh, CLAM can be used, not in the framework of looking at the living cell, but also in other uh, areas. For example, you can use it for, as I said, for validation of uh, super resolution technologies. Okay, this is one of the applications. And we did it in the past uh, validating what we see with 4 pi microscopy. For the sake of the time, I'm not showing it here. Then if you have low transfection efficiency, like in the case, for example, of early studies in immunology, okay, their correlative light electron microscopy could find, uh, allow you and help you to find the uh, group of cells uh, uh, which form, for example, uh, immune synapse, okay? Because that could be not as, to, as easy as it seems uh, on the screen. Uh, and finally, um, one can also look for rare structure or rare phenotypes. For example, if only 10% of the cell in population form a certain structure, which is uh, very small, uh, one can think using uh, correlative light electron microscopy instead of uh, looking uh, uh, at the uh, entire cell population. Now, I will show you example of a later application, okay, in combination with new electron microscopy technology. And it's related to what we do in Teleton Institute of Genetics and Medicine where I'm working. Where I run the lab which studies uh, uh, disease of copper homeostasis. 
one of uh, these uh, uh, diseases is Wilson disease. It's autosomal recessive with the frequency one birth case in 7,000 uh, to 30,000 depending on geographic area. The disease is caused by toxic accumulation of copper mainly in the liver and uh, at certain extent in brain hepatic, neurologic, psychiatric and ocular abnormalities. Now, uh, the protein which is mutated in this disease, ATP7B, is a copper pump. It contains eight transmembrane domains which form a channel to uh, remove copper from the cytosol to cell exterior or to secretory pathway at the expense of ATP hydrolysis. ATP7B is mainly expressed in the liver, a central organ in uh, copper homeostasis. So what liver does when we eat and receive dietary copper, which is absorbed into portal circulation, uh, hepatocytes import copper and uh, uh, what they do first, they shuttle it to ATP7B, which resides usually in trans-Golgi network. Normally, ATP7B loads this copper on the protein called ceruloplasmy. It's of cerulean uh, color when you concentrate it because it contains uh, uh, nine copper atoms. And it's main carrier of copper in our body. And copper is needed for a number of vitally important enzymes. For example, one is uh, uh, cytochrome C. So it's needed for respiration, for example. Now, um, what happens when copper uh, levels exceed certain level? ATP7B <coughs> tends to traffic to the canalicular area of hepatocytes where it participates in excretion of copper into the bile. And with bile uh, and feces, ex uh, excess of copper is eliminated from the body. Now, if ATP7B is missing, so it's not expressive, or can't pump copper or can traffic okay, to the right domain, copper accumulates within hepatocytes, cause oxidative da damage in hepatocyte cells and uh, leads to generation of Wilson disease. The trafficking of this protein is really important for its function, okay, and uh, understanding of it was kind of an infancy uh, a few years ago. So people were uh, saying that uh, uh, basically ATP7B uh, can traffic to peripheral endolysosomal vacuoles and then sequester copper in the lumen. Then copper somehow gets in the bile, but ATP7B is not anymore involved in that process. The alternative view was that ATP7B indeed uh, pump copper into lumen of endolysosomal compartments, and then with them it's uh, uh, delivered to the canalicular domain. The amazing thing is that basically two groups made the study in the same cell type and came to the opposite conclusion. One group said, you know, you, we see ATP 7B in canalicular domain. The other group say, no, we don't see it, okay? So to clarify this issue, uh, at a certain point, uh, we used HEPG2 cells, also used by these two labs, which are of hepatic origin. They undergo polarization, so you can distinguish between <coughs> apical domain and basal atom. Here's an example. MDR1 is an uh, apical marker and e cadherin uh, basal atom. So when this cell, this cell polarize, we make a kind of cyst or canalicular vacuole between neighbor cell, which is sealed by the uh, layer of, of belt of tight junctions, okay? So uh, this polarization can be achieved, although not all cells make the canalicular cysts. And uh, Another advantage of these cells is that they express atp 7 b endogenously, so very good system for investigation. Now, uh, atp 7 b can be labeled, and uh, in low copper, it uh, resides at the trans-Golgi network. In uh, uh, high copper, it moves out to uh, the peripheral structures. 
uh, what we found is then we treat cells which are polarized with the copper, what we see is that ATP cell end up in uh, CD late endosome lysosome positive uh, structures which kind of cluster around this canaliculate system, okay? Around what is analog of a biliary duct in the liver and start to deliver some ATP cell B inside. Then, with uh, uh, ATP, uh, with the in immunofluorescence, we observe ATP cell B signal overlap with uh, a marker of canaliculosis, but at this point, uh, people were criticizing this because they said, you, you never know what, whether it's really colocalization or it's structure which is closed or overlap, so to prove a point, you have to do electron microscopy. The problem that these structures, canalical assist, are not very frequent. So, okay, so get them in simple section is not that easy, okay, as uh, uh, when you do it using light microscopy and have a very big field of, of review. So we employed the correlated light electron microscopy to track this structure canalicular vacuole or canalicular cyst. And this was combined with immunolabeling of ATP 7 bit and we wanted to be sure whether the protein is inside canalicular cyst or not. To do that, we employed with uh, MDR1 uh, uh, GFP as a canalicular marker. So here you can see labeling for ATP 7 b uh, canalicular cysts are formed between these two cells and here is an extraordinary uh, event when you find two of them, okay? Uh, the staining for ATP7B can be converted into the gold because the antibody which we, secondary antibody which we use for labeling contains both fluorochrome and ultra small gold particles which can be amplified and you can uh, uh, buy them from uh, nanoprobes, basically. So, we did make any life cell imaging. Our goal was to look at the structure of interest uh, after fixation. We tracked it using high magnification in light microscope. Then, as you can see, this cell with these two canalicular domain was located on the, uh, what is called uh, cell locate cover slip, and here you have A letter, you can see probably, and the letter K, okay? So this is coordinates, but they are inverted because uh, uh, they are flipped uh, horizontally for the sake of electron microscopy. Then uh, the same specimen was placed in scanning electron microscope, okay? And we found the edge of the K here, and the uh, backscattered electron images uh, showed us where cells are located. So you can see this island, this and this. Also at high magnification, we could uh, see the cell of our interest where it's located. And basically we were zooming in this area and we analyzing this area where the canaliculate cyst was located. Now, we use it so-called dual beam SEM technology, so focused ion beam, SEM. Uh, it's based on the detection of backscattered electrons, okay? So when you use scanning microscopy and hit the specimen with the beam, some electrons called secondary are uh, reflected, <coughs> while others penetrate uh, to some very short distance, like five nanometers inside the specimen and then get back, okay? And using backscattered electron detector, one can generate the image which is really similar to what you see using transmission electron microscopy, right? Okay, so genius people inv invented this method when you basically uh, make a trench, okay, to arrive to cell of your interest, and then you start uh, uh, to remove gradually specimen, okay? So you start milling the specimen with focus uh, uh, ion beam, with uh, ion of gallium, and this allows you to eliminate five nanometers from the surface of the specimen, 
Then using a backscattered electron, you take the image which is identical to electron microscopy image, okay, of transmission electron microscope. Then you remove next five nanometers of your specimen, take another image, and in this case you generate like of tomography of your cell or uh, area of interest with resolution of transmission and quality of transmission electron microscopy. Now, I will show you this example, okay? So what we did, we basically made a trench before this area and start milling uh, and taking the serial uh, images of this cell with uh, the step of 30 nanometers and we went through the 19 micrometers distance during this section. So uh, this was done on the size cross beam uh, uh, PIPs and microscope and you will see now the movie. So the structure of our interest will appear here. So this is, this is a movie of serial sectioning. Uh, here we start to see this canaliculate cyst and it contains a lot of microvilli. You can see gold particles appearing there, so it enlarges, enlarges, and it's really heavily labeled with gold, indicating the presence of protein of our interest, ATP7B. We also detected some lysosomes located nearby and labeled for ATP7B uh, as well. Now the structure ends, okay? You can see also other organelles in serial section like mitochondria and uh, nuclei. And uh, basically, uh, it's allowed us to draw a conclusion that indeed, uh, what we saw as overlap of the ATP7B with uh, uh, apical marker represents real localization of the protein inside this canaliculate cyst, which is formed by two neighbor uh, hepatic cells. Here you can see the cyst highlighted in green, ATP7B in gold. You see that it's only in this apical domain, that it's not present at the basolateral surface of the cell where it shouldn't go. And uh, this cyst is sealed by tight junctions, and this is one cell which forms it, its plasma membrane. And you can see the other cell here below. So this allowed us to say <coughs> and draw conclusion that indeed ATP 70 arrives to late endosome lysosomal structures and then with the exocytosis it's delivered to the canalicular domain and uh, uh, it makes sense because uh, ATP 7B in lysosomes sequester copper in, uh, in the lumen. Then this copper is released if cell exposed uh, further to the copper challenge. But at the same time, it also delivers ATP7B to canalicular area where the uh, protein can pump directly copper from the cytosol into the bile, increasing the efficiency of uh, copper clearance from the cell. So this is the last example which I wanted to show you. I would like to acknowledge people who contributed to the development of uh, correlated light electron microscopy. <coughs> and uh, especially, I would like to thank uh, Alexander Mironov, Sasha Mironov, who is my tutor in EM. And basically, he had this brilliant idea to look at the same structure inside the uh, live cell uh, and then to bring it all to electron microscopy. I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, sponsors let's say, uh, funding agencies and the uh, industrial uh, supporters of other research, and uh, you for your attention.